fun and uh, I'm so happy to be part of this wonderful conference and uh, to now give this presentation on anti-malarian hormone and live birth in recurrent pregnancy loss. So, for the next 20 minutes, we will address AMH in reproduction in general. We will talk about AMH in women with recurrent pregnancy loss. And we will also talk about AMH and the chance of live birth in recurrent pregnancy loss. And then, of course, what's next? So, first, let's address antimalarian hormones in reproduction. So AMH is a measure of the ovarian reserve, and as you very well know, it declines with age. So each line represents a different age group, and the higher age group women have, the lower the AMH uh, levels are. AMH is relatively cycle independent, so compared to many other uh, female sex hormones that we can measure, AMH uh, can be measured throughout the cycle. There is a slight variation uh, with lower levels uh, during ovulation, but otherwise, uh, in, in general, you can uh, assume that the concentration of AMH is quite stable uh, throughout the cycle. So um, there is less inter and inter individual fluctuation then if you use the antral follicle count to assess a woman's um, remaining uh, oocytes. So what we speculated and others have speculated as well is if AMH as such could be a marker of equality. We know that with maternal age, as it increases, the quality of the X also decreases and so does AMH. So in this interesting study, assessing the value of AMH in prediction of uh, spontaneous pregnancy, the conclusion was that low AMH is not as such associated with reduced fecundity in spontaneous pregnancy. So even with a low AMH, it's possible to achieve pregnancy and achieve live birth. So um, in another study looking into whether diminished ovarian reserve uh, was a risk factor for miscarriage, low AMH, or it, the conclusion was that low AMH may be associated with the decreased chance of live birth in IVF pregnancies. So what do we know about AMH in recurrent pregnancy loss? Well, from a meta-analysis of very small studies, it was found that in general, there's an increased risk of diminished ovarian reserve, including lower AMH concentrations, when comparing 155 women with RPL to 150 women without recurrent pregnancy loss. It was also shown that lower AMH uh, exist in women with more pregnancy losses. So comparing those without any pregnancy losses to those with one, two, or three or more pregnancy losses, both AMH and the antral follicle count was lower. And the authors concluded that even after stratification by age, AMH and AFC levels were still significantly lower in the group who had more miscarriages than those who did not have any miscarriages. And also the proportion of women with diminished ovarian reserves uh, was higher in the group with uh, more miscarriages. So is it clinical re clinically relevant to measure age? That is, as always, the big question. So if we look at studies investigating the live birth in the next pregnancies in women with RPL who actually measured AMH, the study sizes were quite small. So only a few studies and with less than 200 women in each. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to do a larger study 
where we investigated antimalarian hormone and live birth in unexplained recurring pregnancy loss. The aim was to investigate if AMH was associated with live birth rate in women with unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss. So we had a cohort of women with recurrent pregnancy loss that were all referred to our national referral center at Copenhagen University Hospital between 2015 and 2021. We screened them for AMH when they were referred, so before pregnancy, and looked at the live birth rate in the first pregnancy after referral. The medium follow-up time was 47 months, but a minimum of one year. And we excluded the women who had a known cause for recurrent pregnancy loss or egg donation. And in our regression analysis, we adjusted for known risk factors in RPL, such as maternal and paternal age, the previous number of losses, BMI smoking, and also uh, we investigated the chance of, or in the investigation of chance of achieving pregnancy, we adjusted for irregular cycles. And in live birth analysis, we adjusted for whether the pregnancy had been achieved by assisted reproductive technology uh, and for the different uh, treatments the women had been offered. So out of the 1,035 women who were referred in the time period, we had to exclude uh, a lot of women, mainly due to explained pregnancy loss, including uh, thyroid dysfunction and autoimmunity, which we will get back to in a later talk this session. So we also had to exclude some exclude some who did not have AMH measurements. That was due to a short period uh, during this uh, time period where the clinic could not afford AMH measurements, so there were no bias in who were offered the measurements and who were not. So in total, we had measurements from 629 women. And let's look a bit at that. When comparing uh, two tiles between low, medium, and high AMH, there was a significantly higher age in the group of women with low AMH and a significantly lower age in the group of women with high AMH. So this is also what we would expect. There was also a difference with more women in the high AMH group having irregular cycles and more women in the high AMH group having a high BMI, which are both, both factors that we would also associate with PCOS. So when we look at the chance of achieving pregnancy, there were 507 women who achieved a pregnancy after their referral. Uh, a little more than half within the first three months, but all of them within the first 12 months. And the proportions of women who achieved pregnancy were similar between those with low, high, medium AMH. So the AMH level in itself did not uh, associate to the chance of achieving pregnancy. The risk of not achieving a pregnancy was higher in the women with a higher BMI in the women with a higher number of previous losses, and also those who had a higher age, but in the adjusted analysis, this was not the case. So, of the women, of the 507 women, we excluded those who had a pregnancy where we know there was a risk factor other than recurrent pregnancy loss going on, such as twin pregnancies, those who had termination of the pregnancy, uh, ectopic pregnancy, molar pregnancy, the two where we did not know the outcome because they had moved from uh, the region, and a few had ongoing pregnancies when we uh, finalized the data. So in total, we were able to include 479 women. So this is a very long table, but the basic conclusion was that there was absolutely no difference in live birth rate according to AMH, regardless of any of the confounders we included. When we compared in red those 
who had another pregnancy loss to those in blue with the live birth in their pregnancy and just looked at the AMH concentrations. Both group had a very nice decline with age, but as you can tell, basically identical uh, AMH levels between those who had live births and those who did not. This is a rock curve showing the same, a very poor discrimination to detect live birth according to AMH levels. So if we just zoom in and just look at the women who had a very low AMH level, we did have 15 women who had AMH levels below 1.9 picomoles per liter. This corresponded to the 2.5th percentile in our cohort. 12 of those women achieved a first pregnancy after referral, 10 out of the 12 spontaneously, one chose to terminate her pregnancy. So of the 11 pregnancies remaining, five had a live birth. So that's a 45.5% live birth rate compared to an overall life birth rate of 64% in women with normal AMH. So even though this is not significant, there may be a slightly increased risk for another pregnancy loss in women with a very low AMH. However, we found it interesting that even those who had almost unmeasurable AMH levels, uh, Almost all of them were able to achieve pregnancy and most of them spontaneously. So zooming in on those women who had a very high AMH, we had 29 women who had AMH levels above 56 picomoles per liter, which was the 975 percentile in the cohort. 23 of them achieved the first pregnancy after referral, 16 of whom achieved it spontaneously. There were two ectopic pregnancies that we excluded. So 14 out of the 21 remaining pregnancies resulted in a live birth rate. So the live birth rate in these women was 66.7 compared to the 64 in the women with a normal AMH. So in general, even a high AMH was also associated with a very good live birth rate. However, one thing we found interesting was that 8 out of 10 women in the entire cohort who had ectopic pregnancies also had high AMH. And whether this has to do with fertility treatment or other factors, we don't know. So in conclusion, AMH concentration is lower in women with recurrent pregnancy loss. But there is no association with the chance of another pregnancy, and there is no association with the chance of live birth in the next pregnancy. So even women with very low concentrations achieve pregnancy and live birth. So our overall conclusion is that there is absolutely no clinical value in measuring AMH in all women with recurrent pregnancy loss. You could consider measuring AMH if women are of high reproductive age and or suffer from infertility where the AMH levels could make a difference to the treatment you will offer. There are some subgroups of women, for instance, those with premature ovarian failure or PCOS that may differ. But even so, we don't believe that AMH is the best predictive marker. So what's next? Well, in Copenhagen, as you will also hear from other sessions, we have the Copenhagen Pregnancy Law Study. And in this study, we will also look into the role of PCOS and AMH levels in uh, pregnancy, including spontaneous pregnancies and in those both with or without a recurrent pregnancy loss. So thank you so much for your, in your attention. That was a you know, very clear, wonderful talk. Thank you. Now, uh, Dr. Bidal will give us a second talk titled Thyroid Autoimmunity and Pregnancy Lot, Screening, Monitoring, and Treatment.
looking forward to the call. Well, to be followed by our discussion. Thank you. Hello again, everyone, and now we will move on to this presentation on the role of thyroid function and autoimmunity and recurrent pregnancy loss. So I have a few disclosures, mainly being that I'm currently co-authoring the upcoming American Thyroid Association guidelines on thyroid and preconception and pregnancy and postpartum, and uh, I'm the editor, editor of a couple of uh, journals and receive speaker speak. So uh, this a slightly longer talk due to, to a cancellation will address uh, why thyroid matters in pregnancy, uh, if it matters in recurrent pregnancy loss and what we can do about it and what is next on our research and clinical agenda. So first to touch upon the thyroid in pregnancy. So as you very well know, the thyroid gland is placed in front of the neck and it produces T3 and T4 hormones, and the numbers just refer to the number of iodine molecules that is bind, bound in the hormones. So uh, upon negative feedback to the pituitary, T3 and T4 hormones that decreases will lead to an increase in TSH, a thyroid stimulating hormone to try to stimulate the thyroid gland to produce more T3 and T4. And the other way around, if there's too much T3 and T4, uh, by feedback to the pituitary, TSH levels will decrease. Uh, so if you're hypothyroid and have a high T4, you will have a low TSH. And if you're hypothyroid, you will have low T4 levels and a high TSH. So these are the basics, but there are a lot of in-betweens that we also discuss in reproduction, subclinical hypothyroidism, which is a normal T4, but with a slightly high TSH, hypothyroxinemia with a low T4 and a normal TSH, and finally, euthyroidism, where both T4 and TSH are normal, but uh, where there are thyroid autoimmunity involved. And especially this has been the center of great attention for the past 10 years. Uh, and we will also uh, talk a lot about this today for recurrent pregnancy loss. So thyroid autoimmunity is of course, when the immune system attacks parts of our own body that it's not supposed to. And in thyroid autoimmunity, the antigen is thyroid peroxidase, uh, an enzyme uh, helping with the production of thyroid hormones and antibodies formed against thyroid peroxidase, thyroid peroxidase antibodies. In short, we normally just say TPO antibodies are the most common antibodies we often measure because those are the ones that are mainly related to the prognosis in the studies we have on thyroid autoimmunity and young women. Of course, there are also TG antibodies and then finally the TSH receptor antibodies involved in Graves' disease, and we will not cover that today. So why is it important in pregnancy? Well, thyroid hormones are quite important for brain development and growth. If you don't uh, have enough thyroid hormone during your um, development, uh, the worst case, like illustrated here, is the development of the syndrome cretinism, where uh, the children are growth retarded and also uh, have mental retardation. So, Fortunately, we don't see this uh, very much today, uh, specifically also because many countries now have a, a screening program for neonates testing for congenital hypothyroidism. But when we talk about thyroid in pregnancy, thyroid function and autoimmunity are related to a wide range of outcomes. So even before the woman becomes pregnant, there are associations with infertility, 
of polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome and premature ovarian failure. And then the topic for this talk, of course, is the early pregnancy complications with pregnancy loss and recurrent pregnancy loss, but also in early pregnancy, maternal thyroid hormones are necessary uh, to be transferred to the fetus in order to secure the neurological development and growth of the fetus. And then moving further along in the pregnancy, uh, thyroid dysfunction autoimmunity has been associated with outcomes such as preeclampsia and gestational diabetes, preterm birth and low birth weight. And then when you're done with your pregnancy, there's an increased risk of postpartum thyroiditis in women with thyroid autoimmunity and perhaps also with postpartum depression. And then finally, the long-term outcomes of the offspring, child ADHD, autism are higher in women with overt uh, thyroid disease, both hypo and hyperthyroidism. And for the woman herself in later parts of life, uh, associations with overt thyroid disease and other autoimmune disease, as we know, there is a great overlap between having one autoimmune disease and developing another. So altogether, a normal thyroid function is key to both achieve and sustain a healthy pregnancy. But if investigating early pregnancy outcomes will also matter for the full uh, remainder of the women's reproductive lifespan and uh, health later in life. So to secure that the fetus gets enough thyroid hormone for its development, there are some physiological changes during a normal pregnancy that we need to know about. So this is beautifully depicted as the HCG levels goes up in early pregnancy. HCG is able to bind to the TSH receptor and stimulate it to produce more T3 and T4 hormones as T4 hormones are uh, transported across the placenta to reach the fetus. And then by negative feedback, as we talked about in the beginning, uh, because the thyroid hormones increase, TSH will decrease. And then we get this beautiful mirror depiction of HCG levels and TSH levels in pregnancy. So this is perfectly normal and TSH should be lower in the beginning of pregnancy than otherwise. And this is why we need pregnancy-specific reference ranges when dealing with pregnant women. Also, the estrogen level increase will stimulate the liver to produce more thyroid-binding globulins. So these will increase throughout gestation and T total T4 levels will reach approximately 150% of the pre-pregnancy levels in mid-gestation. And this, of course, also leads to an increase in total T4. So in basic, the physiological change during pregnancy is that a normal healthy woman, woman will increase her T4 levels and lower her TSH levels. So if we just look at the thyroid autoimmunity, this is also a study measuring thyroid hormones in er or thyroid antibodies in early pregnancy. And as you see, the thyroid antibody levels will decrease throughout gestation. And this is because when a woman becomes pregnant, of course, she will have to regulate her immune system to not reject this uh, fetus of half paternal origin. And because she does so, the autoimmunity will generally improve. And this goes for many other autoimmune diseases that during pregnancy, there's an improvement and some may even not need uh, their medication for their autoimmune disease during their pregnancy. But we also know, and this is uh, women with thyroid autoimmunity and women without, that there is in general a higher TSH level in those with thyroid autoimmunity. And, uh, sorry, and, uh, this means that a TPO antibody positive euthyroid woman, so a woman with normal TSH levels, is actually at risk of developing thyroid dysfunction during pregnancy, even though the thyroid opportunity in itself improves. And this is probably because your thyroid gland has some sort of inflammation, which is illustrated by the antibodies, 
And when she has to increase her thyroid hormone production, she develops a, a slight thyroid hypofunction. Most often, it's just a clinical hypothyroidism. So it is quite common to have thyroid dysfunction and autoimmunity. I'm sure many of you have heard of the tablet trial. We will get back to it later. But in order to conduct this trial, which was of euthyroid TPO antibody positive women, the uh, study group investigated a very large number of women with a history of infertility or pregnancy loss. And doing so, they found that 9.5% had TPO antibody positivity and 4.8% had thyroid dysfunction. So as you see in the parenthesis, it's only a, a few or much smaller number of women who have overt thyroid disease that needs treatment. But it was actually quite many, more than 20%, who had TSH above 2.5. And 9.5% uh, also of those who were euthyroid progressed to thyroid dysfunction, and most of them within three months. So even though they measured uh, TSH levels that were normal at the first uh, screening time point, a lot of women uh, with antibodies progressed to dysfunction within a short period of time. Seven of the women developed overt hypothyroidism, and all of those were in their uh, placebo group, so not receiving NT4 treatment. So there is a natural progression in quite a large number of women who have thyroid autoimmunity but are otherwise euthyroid. So, what is the association with pregnancy loss? Well, this guy was the first to demonstrate the association uh, with thyroid autoimmunity because he's an endocrinologist with a specialty with infertility patients, and he wanted to investigate the risk of developing postpartum thyroiditis in fertility patients with thyroid autoimmunity. However, he became quite frustrated because a lot of the women uh, had a pregnancy loss. And he told his clever wife about this, and she said, well, maybe you should look more into that. And that was the reason why he became the first to show that if you have thyroid autoantibodies, you are at increased risk of a pregnancy loss, even though your thyroid function is normal. So this is uh, his, the numbers from his study, Professor Stegnero Green's study. Uh, the first to be published on infertile women, where you see the difference in pregnancy loss rate between those with thyroid antibodies and those who were negative for thyroid autoimmunity. And then later it was shown by Professor Glenoir that even in uh, healthy euthyroid women with no history of thyroid disease, if they had autoimmunity compared to healthy controls who did not in early pregnancy, the pregnancy loss rate was much higher. So does it matter in recurrent pregnancy loss patients? Yes, it does. Uh, this is a table of results from our Danish registers that are still un unpublished, but with the number of pregnancy losses increasing the association between overt thyroid disease grow stronger and stronger and twice as high in those who have three pregnancy losses or more. So in a systematic review recently published, uh, there are some studies looking into the role of thyroid antibodies, some in euthyroid women, some where thyroid status was not reported. And the numbers uh, were in some cases insignificant and in some significant. Uh, but I want to point your attention to this. They were all very small studies of recurrent pregnancy loss patients. Uh, the maximum number included was 200, but most of them below 100 women included in their studies. So what we did was we wanted to look more into the role of thyroid peroxidase antibodies and prospective flight birth rate. And we conducted a cohort study of women with recurrent pregnancy loss. 
So we did this as a prospective cohort study of all women who were referred to our unit between 2011 and 2017. All women were screened for TSH and TPO antibodies before they became pregnant again. And T4 treatment was started if an endocrinologist evaluated that this was needed. The main outcomes of the study was to investigate how many women actually were TPO antibody positive in this patient population. But of course, the primary outcome was, does it matter in the next pregnancy? What was the life birth rate in the first pregnancy the women achieved after being referred to the unit? In 825 women with recurrent pregnancy loss, we found that 16.8% were TPO antibody positive. And TPO antibody positive women did not differ in age or number of previous losses. Life birth rate was 62.8% in the 454 women who had unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss and achieved pregnancy and their life birth rate was significantly lower in the TPO antibody positive women, also uh, when adjusting for other confounders such as maternal age, the TSH level, number of previous losses, BMI, smoking, conception method, and T4 treatment. So this leads us to the question, what can we do about it? And in our study, we found that if we compared the TPO antibody positive women to those without antibodies, there was a significant difference in live birth rate, but also with T4 treatment. So those who were thyroid antibody positive and received T4 treatment had a significantly higher live birth rate than those who were antibody negative or those who did not receive T4 treatment sorry, the TPO antibody negative women were uh, also had a higher life birth rate. So this does not mean that everyone should get the thyroxine treatment, but it means that in a populational observational study, those who had a treatment indication for T4 tr treatment actually had an improved life birth rate uh, when starting the T4 treatment. So this is a nice treatment in those who need it. So let's focus more on the randomized control trials that are available. So uh, one of them was by Roberto Necro, and he showed that when comparing a group of euthyroid pregnant women who had thyroid antibodies, those who had levothyroxine treatment, um, compared to a group with no thyroid antibodies who were euthyroid, they had a similar miscarriage rate. And this miscarriage rate was significantly lower than the group with thyroid autoimmunity who uh, had the placebo treatment. So there was a lower risk of another pregnancy loss in this study. Uh, the only bias to this study is that the first endocrinology endocrinological visit took place at gestational age, uh, ages that were mainly above 10 weeks. So at this point, 90% of women will have suffered their pregnancy loss. Also in group A, 40% of the women started their T4 treatment by the eighth week and 79% only by the 12th week. So the uh, intervention started very late and at a time point where we would normally have seen the pregnancy losses. So also, it's very small numbers included in this study. So if we look at the two very large randomized control trials that exist of women with recurrent pregnancy loss, the t for life study and TAPLET study, Let's look at it one by one. The included patients in the T for Life study, the recurrent pregnancy loss was defined as two or more losses. They did not have to be consecutive. Uh, and the pregnancy losses had to occur before the 20 week of gestation. In the tablet study, 
the women needed to have a history of one or more pregnancy losses and the study expanded to also include infertile women. Now the T4 Live study was powered to detect a 20% live birth rate difference and the tablet to, discu to, to discover a 10% difference in live birth. In T4 Live, they actually aimed to include 240 women, but ended up with 187 women due to recruitment issues. In the tablet study, the total number of included women were 952. Euthyroidism was defined differently. So in the T4 Life study, it was based on pre-pregnancy TSH reference ranges based on each participating institution. Whereas in the tablet study, euthyroidism was defined as TSH between a specific cutoff, regardless of which of the multi-sensors that uh, included the women. The T4 dosage was based on body weight and pre-pregnancy TSH in the T4 life, and the tablet administered 50 micrograms daily. And then the visits were pre-pregnancy, first and second trimester in T4 life, whereas the tablet study had pre-pregnancy visits every three months, but then in pregnancy, three visits per pregnancy. So the outcomes were that in T4 Live, there was no difference between the euthyroid TPO antibody positive women receiving levothyroxine treatment compared to those who received placebo treatment. And in the tablet, this was also the case, there was no significant difference between the groups in live birth rate. And there were no significant difference between groups in any of the other investigated outcomes such as preterm birth or uh, neonatal outcomes. So the overall conclusion is that there was no difference in live birth between placebo and levothyroxine groups. So why is this? Well, some of it may have to do with the study design because they excluded any woman who had a TSH increase during pregnancy. So those who started out euthyroid but progressed to TSH increase dropped out of the study. Also, the dosages were quite low used in both studies, both in the T for life and in the tablet study. But in short, I think the main conclusion that rests is that levothyroxine therapy does not work in women who do not need levothyroxine therapy. So if you have a euthyroid woman with normal TSH and normal T4, and she continues to have a normal TSH and a normal T4, there is no need for T4 treatment. And why do we then see the association that we still see between thyroid autoimmunity and pregnancy loss? One reason is probably a dysregulation of the immune system. So this figure just demonstrates an imbalance between the anti-inflammatory responses and the pro-inflammatory responses. And this overweight of, for instance, TH17 cells is seen not only in a thyroid disease, but also a wide range of other autoimmune diseases, SLE, uh, systemic sclerosis, but also in recurrent pregnancy loss. So it's probably this dysregulation that contributes to part of uh, the increased risk in TPO antibody positive euthyroid women. So what we want to do next is investigate the associations in the Copenhagen Pregnancy Loss Study, where we look at any pregnancy loss, not just recurrent pregnancy loss, but also first-time pregnancy loss. And we include everyone to also be able to uh, distinguish those with chromosome abnormalities and those without it. And our hypothesis is that those with thyroid autoimmunity or thyroid hypofunction will probably have an increased risk of suffering a euthyroid uh, and also euploid, normal chromosome numbers, uh, pregnancy loss. So in conclusion, thyroid autoimmunity is associated 
with pregnancy loss, levothyroxine treatment benefits outcomes in observational studies such as the one we did in our recurrent pregnancy loss unit. It's probably because we're giving the correct dosage to women who actually have thyroid dysfunction. So those women should, of course, still be treated. What the randomized trials show is that there's no benefit of giving T4 to a woman who is euthyroid. We need to be better to explore the mechanisms because by doing so, we can better target our intervention. And now what should you do in your clinic? Well, women with recurrent pregnancy loss Pregnancy loss should be screened for thyroid dysfunction and thyroid autoimmunity. And this is because there are there is a good intervention in levothyroxine treatment in case the woman is actually hypothyroid or hyperthyroid, which there is a clear association with recurrent pregnancy loss. So thyroid dysfunction should be treated before the patients become pregnant again. The euthyroid women should not be treated with levothyroxine. But you should keep repeating TSH if when the woman achieves pregnancy. And this is because we know that there's a higher risk of developing thyroid dysfunction later on in the euthyroid TPO antibody positive women. We as researchers should be or need to explore the mechanisms to better target the interventions. And with this, I thank you for your attention and to all my collaborators and the foundation supporting my work. And with this, we will move on to the question and answers part of this session. Thank you. So hello everyone again. And uh, we will now begin the discussion part of this session. So if anyone have questions, please uh, feel free to, to write them in the chat and we can discuss them in this panel. Welcome, Dr. Ekerman. Thank you for a very nice uh, talk early in this session. So just to begin our discussion, I wanted to ask Professor Eta if, if you think... Um, or, or how you would um, also include the aspect of immunology and autoimmunity in the discussion on endometriosis and, and infertility and pregnancy loss. All right, thank you. Um, I mean, theories are always nice. Endometriosis is a chronic inflammatory disease, and it's possible that the immune system may be playing a role. We don't even still know exactly why some women have endometriosis despite everyone having um, so some some amount of retrograde menstruation. But honestly, from a clinical perspective, you know, ART data does not suggest you know, endometriosis affects almost any aspect. I mean, the outside developmental potential seems to be similar, at least. And then receptivity of utopic endometrium seems to be similar. And even for outside um, ART, we've always been taught that endometriosis causes infertility. And yeah, I mean, as an infertility specialist, I see a lot of people with endometriosis, but we don't even know how we, if, if it really causes it, except for triple blockage. So since the clinical outcomes are similar so far, right? I don't think we will be having a immune immunologic assessment or immunologic treatment for endometriosis associated infertility in the future. I hope I don't sound too short sighted, but that is what I think. And meanwhile, may I ask you one question oh. that actually, okay, so the, the, the thyroid poke, I mean, the other one as well, was very clear, I mean, methodical. You know, each slide answered the question that came to my mind, you know, one after the other, wonderful. But, so how do you take it, like, basically, it's it's a broader question. How do we define normal, like, thyroid function? How do we define 
you thyroid is so basically different societies project different things if you look at the general offices and kind of called the societies i mean they they are more lenient even I don't know if it's still the same, but until recently, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists did not even recommend the TSH take before pregnancy unless the woman was symptomatic. Okay? And in most places, you know, thyroid is, I mean, hypothyroidism is defined by TSH over 96 percentile, which is usually over 4.5, 4.9. And then there were these few papers suggesting it should be less than 2.5 without really. I would say, you know, hard outcomes. Okay. And so now, all right, I'm convinced that thyroid antibody positivity is associated with you know, negative reproductive outcome. But is it really true thyroid dysfunction or are, do you think, are they markers for whatever, well, like something else, a generalized immune dysfunction, et cetera? Maybe that's, the, that's why the another study before doesn't work. Yes, so th this is an, an excellent question and what, of course, uh, a, a point we are debating consistently in also our guideline work because we probably need to distinguish. There's quite good evidence that if, if women have high TSH levels, so even if they are subclinical hypothyroid with normal T4, there's a benefit of levothyroxine treatment in, in patients undergoing um art treatments or assisted reproductive techniques. So, so because there was a guideline in 2011 suggesting that the upper limit of TSH should be 2.5, we've had a lot of studies looking into outcomes based on this cutoff. And we now know that this is far too low in many populations, as I also showed from the tablet trial, it's 20% of all of our women who have a TSH level above 2.5. And, and I don't think any of us uh, will suggest that 20% of all women should be treated with levothyroxine. So, so um, there's no evidence to support that this should, should be beneficial. But even studies that then um, look into to whether they can reproduce some of their results using a higher cutoff for TSH, so a, a above the approximately four, they show that in those women there is a benefit. And and therefore, I think it's very important to discuss what, what is actually normal. And for women who are not pregnant, that means we should use the laboratory's own uh, TSH reference range. Then when women become pregnant, because they have this uh, stimulation of the TSH receptor by, by the HCGs, um, TSH should go down. It's a physiological phenomenon, right? So because T3 and T4 levels go up in a healthy pregnancy, TSH levels will go down. So, so the reference range used for the non-pregnant populations in laboratories will be uh, far too high, the upper limit of TSH. So it's important if, if you have any chance to do so to convince your laboratories to, to generate pregnancy-specific reference ranges. And if this is not possible, we still don't have a very good answer on what to do in case you don't have your own trimester-specific reference range. Um, we just did a study within the Consortium on Thyroid in Pregnancy, which is a large collaboration between more than 20 international cohorts of healthy women who had their thyroid function measured uh, during pregnancy. And, and we demonstrate that there's a very high risk of misclassification if you just apply this fixed limit, say TSH level of four, uh, it's it's worse than generating your trimester specific reference range, but it is an ongoing debate because it is difficult to to have in laboratory do their own trimester specific reference range. But basically, what you need is is less than two hundred pregnant women uh, who are antibody negative. So it's it's possible if you're in an institution who, for instance, do a first trimester risk assessment. Um, 
many hospitals do so for down screening. And if they have their blood drawn anyway, uh, the laboratory can measure TSH. So that's one suggestion, but that's a very long explanation. I think uh, for the thyroid autoimmunity and euthyroidism, so those with a normal thyroid dysfunction, as I mentioned in my talk, they still have a higher risk of a pregnancy loss. But I think it's very clear also from the T4 Life study and the tablet trial that their problem is not a T4. It, it, it doesn't make sense. So in that subgroup, it's probably just uh, the thyroid autoimmunity is a marker of, of a general immune dysregulation. So studies will also come out, I think, within the next uh, years, investigating if we can somehow regulate the immune system in, in this group of women and if that could be beneficial. But it's a little too soon to, to talk about that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions on the chat box? Can you see one? Yeah, so that is, I think that's for you. It's about AMH. Is it suggested that we should no longer measure AMH in recurrent pregnancy loss pa patients as part of the clinical practice? So, yes. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can expand the question. Were we ever measuring it really? I mean, for RPL? No, I think it's very clear, at least from our results, but also from the literature as it is, that it it has no clinical value. And exactly. I mean, what, what, what would you, you tell the woman? Yes, you can, you, maybe you will find a very low AMH, and so what? <laughs> the women can become okay. pregnant anyway and have a live birth. And, and so, you know, what, I find, what I find problematic with ovarian reserve studies in general for either explaining infertility or recurrent pain blood. It's like blaming the patient. Right? So basically there's, there's no clear association. Then you know someone just tells the woman, you know, she's already said, oh your your ovarian reserve is low, that's because of that. And then you know, I think I would feel very bad. Right. And when it's not substantiated by you know like solid evidence, it's really unjustified. So I don't think you can blame the patients and it's not something we can modify. So another question for you, you're very popular today. A group of thyroid-related genes are highly expressed in the endometrium, and importantly, they are temporarily, temporarily regulated across the cycle. Any idea how the thyroid hormone can impact, can impact on endometrial activity, endometrial function, let's say? Well, any cell in the body has uh, thyroid receptors. So thyroid hormones affect basically any part of the system, including the reproductive uh, system. Um, so how exactly we know if it can impact the endometrium, I have no uh, specific knowledge on that. No, but uh, but I know that if if women have a with thyroid disease, they will um, forty percent of them will have. Uh, irregular menstrual periods and that's probably due to to the sex hormones as well um, so the receptors are all around yes okay so let me ask a question to dr ackerman am i pronouncing it right though how well, how is the correct pronunciation arnold ashman ashman or right. so like the syndrome <laughs> but i mean that's spelled differently anyways so we mm -hmm. are all in. I mean, I I can't agree more that you know the, the the male part is kind of neglected in fertility practice. Right? So it may be justified to some extent because we're born from the oocyte. Most functions are coming from the oocyte. It's the cell that leaves and becomes the embryo. But there must be more to the sperm, and we know very little. So we, I'm open-minded. We're looking for different ways to assess. But I mean, at least you know, just until last year when we were preparing the unexplained infertility guideline for ASHRAE. So looking at all these um, DNA assessment studies about sperm, right? so be it unfluidy, I mean, be it you know, fragmentation, etc. It is very difficult to find, you know, like convincing evidence to act on. So. And I, I, I kind of observe, I mean, urologists 
or andrologists who like spending more time with this sometimes they have different opinions. So in your practice, I mean, do you ever offer, I mean, sort of some DNA assessment? If you offer it, who do you offer it? And then how do you act on the results in, in your daily practice? Okay, so talking about uh, recurrence pregnancy loss and the difficulty to to achieve the pregnancy, talking about DNA fragmentation, yeah, one of the, the major factors for recurrence pregnancy loss is the DNA damage, you know, the fragmentation, sperm DNA fragmentation. And so a few weeks ago, I needed to take to uh, to retrieve sperm direct from the testes because the DNA, the quality of DNA is better from the testes than in the ejaculate because the fragmentation happens when the sperm goes through the epididymis and to the ejaculations. So sometimes we need to take it out. Every time we must, we, we must uh, optimize the male fertility. So we must evaluate, evaluate the, the hormone profile, the, the health of the male, like if he's obese, we uh, order him to lose weight, to stop to smoke, everything to improve his fertility. And sometimes we have nothing to improve anymore, no vertical cell to treat uh, his health and so on. So sometimes we must take uh, the sperm from the testes because the, this, the damage is lower directly from the testes. We have studies talking about the if three times lower uh, the, the damage from the DNA directly from the test. So it's a controversial talking about uh, if we need, if the man has a sperm in the ejaculate, if we need to use sperm from the test. But sometimes when you evaluate the sperm DNA fragmentation and it's higher, especially when it's above 30%, uh, regardless of the technique that you use to evaluate STD, Combe, uh, Tuno, or... Um, uh, the fourth. Uh, so independently of the four kind of tests, if the, the DNA fragmentation is high, we use sometimes the, the, the sperm from the tests. But uh, summary, we must improve the male fertility as we can. Yeah, I mean, no way. I can't agree more. We need to improve it absolutely. Just we need to find the correct yeah, I mean, tests and interventions. Um, so if someone in the ejaculate by any test, any of the sperm DNA fragmentation tests you use, because I mean, sperm DNA fragmentation test is an umbrella term. There are different genetic tests, test platforms, which can which you can use. So what is the, assuming it is relevant, uh, assuming it's relevant, um, what would be the intervention? Is it just like recommending change of lifestyle? Uh, obviously, if someone is, you know, uh, is uh, extremely overweight, I mean, smokes too much or you know, like drinks too much or doesn't exercise. I mean, those are more or less the same recommendations we would give to anyone, regardless of from DNA fragmentation or so try to maintain a healthy lifestyle. I mean, additionally, what, what, what does one do? I mean, do you recommend antioxidants or... Sorry, could you repeat the question again? The sound is so, not good for me. Assuming sperm DNA fragmentation is relevant, it's just an assumption uh -huh. since it's not proven. Okay. Mm -hmm. What would be the intervention? I mean, so you have a couple. I mean, the male has high sperm DNA fragmentation with one of the tests. Then what, what, what mm -hmm. are we supposed to do with it? It depends, especially it depends on the, the time that we have to improve it. Like we special... Think about the male, the female fertility too. If she's young or have uh, a lower um, um, quantity of eggs, that we don't have time. If, uh, sometimes the the the, the couple, the, the the female has uh, she is old, like for more than forty years. So we don't have time to uh, wait for the improvements. Sometimes we must uh, take the the use the the uh, laboratory. Uh, system reproduction, uh, artificial reproduction technology, because we don't have time to to improve uh, the the male fertility. Because the the, the produce of one sperm, the the spermatogenesis, we need seventy five days to produce one sperm. So everything that we can improve the male fertility, we must wait at least three months. So we must look 
everything around. And that's why we must uh, work together as a, a team. So the, the andrologist with the man, the gynecologist with the female, and we talk together to conduct the best way for this couple for them. Yeah, there's still way to go. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions in the chat box or uh, from the audience? I see, okay. a, I see a question here, but I think it was just yeah. uh, only directed to me. But uh, Mona Shama asked how frequently we should measure TSH in the TPO antibody positive women in, in pregnancy. And this is an excellent question. And I don't think we have very strong evidence but we lean on what we know from, from other pregnant women that we monitor for thyroid dysfunction, which is we measure every four to six weeks. So as soon as pregnancy is achieved, uh, TPO antibody positive women are part of the group that we would recommend all, all women should have measured TSH once they become pregnant, if they're in this group uh, with the TPO antibody positivity. And if TSH is normal, you can measure again four to six weeks later and assess if the woman was able to increase her thyroid hormone production sufficiently so that she has, still has a normal TSH, or if this stress factor that pregnancy is to the thyroid, if, if she couldn't manage and she has now had a TSH increase. What we know in Denmark, and we have actually included this in, in our guideline now, is that if you repeat the test a few weeks later, if you only have a very slightly higher TSH than normal, about half of the women will have a normal TSH if you repeat the test. So if it, it's a very nice study conducted in the northern part of Denmark, and it showed that those who had TSH above six, so a bit higher than the normal uh, upper limit, which is four, they almost all of them had uh, still had an increased TSH. So in those women, you would start treatment right away. But if you have a woman who only have a TSH of 4.5, we actually now recommend to just wait a few weeks and repeat the test to avoid to treat far too many women. The thing is that because it's been a part of common practice to treat a lot of women with levothyroxine, we now also see from observational studies that there is actually some harm in treating a, a woman who, who doesn't need C4 treatment. So in those who have very low uh, TSH when they started treatment, and by that I mean those who, who in the time where we had the 2.5 limit, those who had TSH below four, there was an increased risk of preeclampsia in their pregnancy and an increased risk of preterm birth. So probably you could induce a slight hyperthyroidism in a woman who doesn't need T4 treatment. So this is why we're a little more careful. We used to say that levothyroxine is a harmless treatment, but now we know that it's, it's actually not the case. So we should save it for those who have a high TSH, and if it's only slightly high, maybe just repeat the test after a few weeks to make sure that it is actually high and it's not just due to a flu or something. Yes. So there's a question about the dose to give and the normal starting dose is 50 micrograms per day. And then when you repeat the test four weeks later, you can see if the woman needs uh, to, to have a higher uh, dosage. Yes? So I see no further yeah. questions and I don't know if, if this should conclude our session or if you have any other comments. All I can say is it was a pleasure. Thanks for the organization and involvement. I enjoyed the lectures very much myself and looking forward to see each other again. Okay. I agree. Thank you very much to the organizers and attendees. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.